coming out from Khaberon in Botswana. So I'd like to introduce you, ladies and gentlemen, to someone else who is doing property on their own in a different town, in a different country from what we're used to. Because we're always talking about property in South Africa, but outside South Africa, there is also properties and we can hear about it. Satunya, so, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, I haven't been to Botswana for a while. And um, the last time I was there, I was still an employee of the bank. Um, I, the bank kind of like introduced me on the love of traveling because I mm -hmm. used to travel quite a bit. And uh, in Botswana, I used to like coming through there because a lot of my colleagues would fly from Johannesburg to South Africa to Gabs. Uh, I used to drive because I used to think if you have to do two hours at the airport and another two hours of uh, another hour of, uh, of flying and potentially another kind of like another hour to get away off, off the airplane and doing all of those things. That's already four hours and I'm about, about three and a half hours of drive. So I used to do the driving, but enough of me. Who is sure. Satunya? So uh, Satunya, I am a Mutwana. I was born and raised in Botswana. I lived overseas for a few years while I was getting my degree. And then I came back home um, after I got my degree in actuarial science. And then I started working in one of the life insurance companies locally. And I worked there for 13 years, then moved and worked in the short-term space um, briefly for about two years. And then I've just recently joined a mining company. Okay. You went overseas. Where did you go? I went to Canada and Australia. Okay. So you're in Canada and in Australia. Um, and you were there for educational purposes. As a young black woman coming through from Africa, you're going through into a first world country. Uh, and in terms of going, where did you go first? Canada or Australia? Canada first. Canada. Yeah. Totally different in terms of environment. Extremely cold. Um, potentially you hadn't seen snow because you know we don't have snow. Yeah, that's true. I hadn't. <laughs> and and you were there and boom, you have snow. And um, I don't know whether they had inducted you or you know, you put on multiple layers of clothes for you to survive. And here we kind of like do like one layer, you kind of like okay. Mm -hmm. How was that experience coming from one space where you kind of like grew up and then you go into a new environment and a lot of what you know actually has to change? So with Canada, it was, I went into a boarding school. I yeah. was 17. I went yeah. into a boarding school with other 16, 17, 18 year olds. Yeah. And for the better part, we were on campus. And so you didn't feel like you were really in Canada because it was also an international school. So there were kids from like right. 80 different. And on top of that, I was on the Western side of Canada, which fortunately is not as cold as the Eastern side. So it was more London weather than yeah, Canadian, yeah. typical Canadian weather. But in terms of um, changing and um, dealing with a different culture. Obviously, I had to go through that and learn how to live in a totally different environment. One, uh, I didn't have the opportunity to call my parents every day like I used to be able to call when I was at home. And then Australia was the one where it was totally different because there it was university. And one, I had to start off getting my own apartment. That was the first time I had lived out of home and out of um, a boarding school setup. I had to start paying my own bills. So I had to really, you would get our, our allowance and you'd manage it for two weeks. So make sure you pay the rent, buy the food, save enough money for transport. And then every semester you would have to think, you'd have to make sure that you buy all the books that you need to, to buy. How did you figure the budget? Because this is totally new to you. Um, and now all of a sudden you need to manage budgets. Uh, how did you figure that out? I I don't know. I just <laughs> ended up um, figuring it out. I've been in boarding school for about seven years. Yes, yeah. boarding school is different. You can always call home and say, mommy, daddy, I need a little bit of more pocket money. But right. still, even with that, you, there's an expectation that you're being given money 
and you must know how long it's going to last for. Fortunately, my parents got, got me used to managing my own money from, I think I was about 12 years old. I got my own bank account with a debit card. So then I knew how to deal with the banking system. I could, I knew how to go into an ATM, operate an ATM. And even when I was with my parents, they would send me to the bank to cash checks. So I already knew, I learned how to navigate the financial um, system at a very young age. So people that are, um, it, it sounds like your parents were, uh, we call it uh, feather, you know, so they were advanced in thinking. So your parents were a little bit feather. Um, I mean, at 12 years old, not so many people in today, this is 2021. I mean, we were talking 12 years ago, that, that was a while ago for you. But I mean, we took talking 2021 and the idea of having 12 year, uh, 12 year olds having their own <clears throat> bank account, I think for many is still foreign, you know? And for many, we're still kind of like managing our kids, like, oh no, they're still small or they're babies. But I think your parents actually set you for success at that particular young they age. They did, yeah, right? they really did. They were creating independence for you, right? And, and that kind of like started playing out, obviously, now when you're in, uh, in Canada, I mean, you're in a totally foreign country. And now you're in, in Australia and you're a younger woman, you don't have to be dependent on anyone and you are self-sustained. Um, and I think for many of things, we might think that, hey, you figured it out. I mean, I, I asked you about the budget, you said you figured it out. But the learnings actually started much earlier than that. You know, we from did, when you yeah. were 12, you know, if you're really now wanting to kind of like, let's zoom in a little bit. But what made you to come back? Um, so I wanted to come back home. I went to school um, on a government scholarship. So when I went to Australia to get my degree, it was on yeah. a government scholarship. It was at the time typical for the government to sponsor Young Badzona to go overseas with the expectation that they would come back home and develop right. whatever industry they were studying for. So I was studying to become an actuary. And at the time there were, I think probably three people who were working in that field and two of them were not Badzona. So you, it was really coming in and starting something from scratch. Yeah. And the pressure to come back and <laughs> yeah. deliver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so on Australia, you now come back home and you came back and now you need to deliver on um, what they have done for you. So the question now that I'm going to ask of you now, uh, Stringer, is that at what point now did you now start to kind of like figure out that you need to do property? So I got into property by pure accident. My yeah. first job, I started working in April. If you're in the actual space, I think most of us were just, you get your degree, then you focus on um, writing your professional exam so you qualify. So I yeah. get a job and I sign the contract because uh, I they had asked me how much I wanted to earn and my offer letter came back with the number that I had given. So I was really? very excited. Yeah, <laughs> I was very excited and didn't read the full terms. I started yeah. in April, come December, I get a... A letter there's the official company communication that oh you're going to be getting your 13th check so i'm like okay. 13th check okay i was not expecting that and at the time i was living at home with my mother and my sisters i was like i'm not expecting that um and coincidentally at the time one of my aunts was selling her piece of land in sarowe which is our home village right and i was like okay i've got this money that i had not budgeted for and I then spoke to my aunt. I said, look, I can give you 75% of your asking price. And then the other 25%, I'll give it to you over the next two months. And she agreed. So that was the first piece of land I bought. Um, and I liked that piece of land because it was um, a few family members had, bought, um, had also gotten land in that same area. So my next door neighbor to my right um, is my uncle. And behind me is my cousin. And next to my uncle is another cousin. Okay. So it was a family neighborhood. And then yeah. I think a year later, my mother needed to needed some um, money. She didn't have access to cash. So she was not liquid. I was liquid. So I said, it's okay. I'll buy your plot in Palape. Huh. <laughs> and then I bought my mother's plot in Palape. I then 
didn't develop um, these two properties for a number of years. So I effectively right. started land banking before I even knew the term. Then I was ready to start um, looking or buying a property for myself. I looked at a few houses on the market and I hated them, like terribly hated them. All of them had issues that I just could not live with. I then yeah. decided, oh, okay, I'll just buy a piece of land and then build what I want. So I went from zero experience to building a 250 square meter house. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but and then from there, the bud just bit. I loved the, um, the process of walking into a piece, an empty piece of land, which was just bush. Um, yeah. and, and then conceptualizing what's supposed to come out of it and watching the stages. So even in my house right now, I've got a series of pictures that shows the process of building my house. Oh, come on. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. Well done. Well done. Let, let's, let's talk about the fact that, you know, it, it almost sounds like you went into property by accident. You know, you, yeah. you're almost helping other people. That's what it sounds like, right? Uh, your aunt needed some money and you were liquid at that time. You could have given her the money without taking the land. You could have. Yeah, I could have, but I, I knew that at some point I was going to need my own house in Saroe right. because that's my ancestral village and that's where my mother lives. My grandmother yeah. Yeah. lived there. So I, I, I still wanted some independence. I didn't want to be living at my mother's house. We usually went there in December. So I didn't want to be living at my mother's house in December. I, I, I like your thinking. So at a young age, you have just started working and you now start accumulating assets, right? Um, at this time, you know, the assets are not really producing any money for you. Um, you know, in my world, they are still a liability because we need to pretend them a little bit. But from a balance sheet perspective, they are an asset because now um, there is a value in your balance sheet. You know, you bought them, yeah. there is a value there. Now, Having said that, the, the question that I want to ask of you is, wow, you, you, you buy a piece of land, you have no idea what it's for, right? You're just buying it. You're just helping out your relatives. That's what you're doing, your mom, your aunt. And um, there you are now. How did you now get the awakening moment of, oh, you can actually do something with the property or there is money in property. How, how, how did that journey now, I mean, how, how did you figure that out? So it, it started after I built my house. I knew that um, I could then get um, a lot of equity release by building. Um, right. I could build equity by building my own properties instead of just buying. Um, there was at the same time a housing boom in Cabroni. So we then, uh, my cousin and I um, said, you know what, let's buy a distressed property and fix it up and flip it. We did that property. And then after that, we started doing other property developments. I bought two plots on in an upcoming neighborhood, um, a new suburb in Khabaruni, built the first house. Um, so uh, actually, I didn't sell the first house. I then decided to rent it out. And then mm. on the second piece of land, I built another house, which at some point I needed to do renovations on my house. I then said, I'll move into that house before I sell it so that I can um, fix my house up and then sell it. And then after that, I then also just started acquiring more land because I knew that I would be able to build properties, um, not to sell, but to thingy, but to, to rent out. I, yeah. I started, I had different, my strategy has evolved over the, the years. So I started out with just land banking because I knew at some point I'd be able to build on that land. I did flips, a flip with a partner. The partnership worked, but I think we're at different stages in terms of what we wanted and how quickly we wanted to get our return. I then went into build um, and sell, which worked and I made my profit at that point but I then decided that for leasing I would do multi-residential places so I've got properties that um, are multi-residential and then in 2019 I went back to buy cheap and then renovate and rent um, there's a mining town running is like 
the largest diamond deposit in the world or gem quality diamond deposit in the world. So I bought a property there, renovated it, and I'm now renting it out. You've got a couple of strategies that you implement. And yeah. like, I, I'm excited because um, you are doing all of these strategy, uh, you're doing all of these strategies and it's, it's circumstantial. Mm -hmm. uh, you haven't gone out to say, oh, there is a strategy like flipping or there is a strategy, you go in, you learn hard, you're acquiring a lot of information. So uh, the reason why I'm sh sharing this with you is that uh, down here in Johannesburg, um, I've, I've got students, people, you know, that come to me and then they learn. And I see a lot of people that go out there and acquire humongous information. But when it comes to execution, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and I, there is nothing wrong with that. But personally, I feel like it's extremely wrong. I am happy to be a doer like you. Like you and me, we could be brass, right? Mm. Because you're a doer and in the mix of it, you kind of like figure out, oh, it's land bank. They're like, ah, I did that. Oh, five years ago. That's what it's called, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, and for me, doing teaches you something rather it than does. you going it's out there. Much. Yeah. Exactly. So rather than you going out there learning, 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 and people who are going to be listening to this, they're like, how about TJ? You're always saying you should learn. Yes, you should learn. But I, I, I am so privileged and honored to be talking to you because you're a doer and the learning is coming in in your doing. So you're really taking courage in the fact that you can do, right? But I will so there's, also... There's, I, I, I understand what you're trying to teach um, people and I also want people to be cautious about yeah. um, following my approach is that yeah. I, I was also learning along the way reading along the way um, that obviously you pick up information as you're doing stuff you meet people as you're doing stuff who teach you other things as well and you say oh okay this makes sense so for example as I was buying some of the land, one of the agents that I was using talked about um, this new suburb that I was talking about. Yeah. And then I said, okay, let me see what's happening out there. I got to the suburb and I said, you know what? At the time it was just um, roads and streetlights. And I said, this is a full development and the value of the houses that are going to come, come out here is going to be phenomenal. So I need to buy into it. So let me give you an example. <clears throat> I'm glad you, you, you touched on that because I've got a project now that I'm busy working on. And on this project, I have hired someone else who does inspections, right? So it's a project, I can't get to it, but then I've hired someone for them to be able to do inspections for me, right? So that I can approve payments and things like that. They are professional, yeah. that's what they do for a living. For, for a living. Somewhere along the line, she then says to me, look, I don't think you need me. You, you need my dad. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, why? And she says, well, your project, I think the skill is what you need. So I'm like, okay, fine, I'm open-minded. Uh, she looks like she could be older than me. So I'm like thinking a dad, you could be maybe worse off. And the, I meet up with a guy and this guy has done more than 5,000 builds. Okay, wow. In his lifetime. Okay, wow. he's still active. On top of that, he is as open-minded as possible, but strict in terms of, no, we agreed this is what's going to happen when we mm -hmm. were planning, so it has to happen, right? So I've totally fallen in love with him the first day I met up with him, right? But what have I just found? Because I went out to do something, I wasn't reading about development because I went out and I started putting action into something, I've now met someone else who can be a mentor to me. Yes. Right? I've now met someone else whom I can lean on in terms of their skill. Yes, I'm yeah. going to pay them, yes, but I'm like 5,000 houses, come on. 
what what can go and wrong? You just that he hasn't access seen? a whole new database of contractors, potential buyers, um, high sellers. High five! High five! <laughs> high five! <laughs> So, th so this is this is I think my pinnacle point of do stuff, you know, do Start. stuff and 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 start learning as you're growing because who you meet on the road, it's people that you will never meet whilst you're learning. It's people that you will never meet whilst you're watching YouTube like this for years and years yeah. and years. But have have the balance. But the starting point for me is extremely crucial. So I'm happy that you know, uh, for you. The journey has been you you, you started uh, accidentally yes but you took it seriously and along the way you started picking up contacts you started picking up opportunities okay so 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 I almost want to come back to the conversation of when when you figured out that there's an opportunity for you to uh, to build multilets and then you can rent them out you know multiple yeah. properties on on one stand. Now, had this been done in Botswana, was there anything like that anywhere else in Botswana at that particular time? Yes. So there is, even up to now, I think there's still a good um, multi-residential market sure. because a lot of people can't afford the freestanding rentals. And for a lot of people, there's also the security aspect. So it gives them um, security um, or access to affordable housing that's yeah. also secure at the same time. Okay. Good and stuff. and because the way Habron is structured, it's there's the main city and then there are surrounding villages. Now in the surrounding villages, they've got larger plots, like the old plots that some families were allocated in the 70s, 80s. So some of those families are now selling those plots, and that's what you can then convert into multi-residentials. When we started having the conversation, you're still employed. Yes, I am. And you're doing this full time. Um, so I would say I'm doing it part time, although I, I got married recently, so I also do it with my husband. So we, we add up a few hours on it. Okay, good. And, and being married in the background, I can hear that there is kids there. So, yes. <laughs> so you are employed and you have a side business and you're married because obviously your husband is also demanding in terms of, you know, you still need to be a wife out there. I, anyway right uh, yeah. and you still need to be a mom and you still need to look after you like yes. where, do you, where do you get the time so i we found a way to make it work with my husband right. um i we both discuss what are the areas that we want to get into and he will go out and look for the land where we need to buy the land right. and I would come in and say, does the land work? What can we do with the land? And then from there, I also have conversations with the architect around really what do you want? So I come in at design stage. And normally my design stage, I've already conceptualized the end product. And I already know the, um, the client I'm targeting and whether I think that client can afford what I want to build and what is it that they are looking for. So I always, I follow Stephen Covey's, uh, one of Stephen Covey's highly, uh, um, seven, habits, seven Habits of Highly Efficient People. I start yeah. with the end and I can already picture what the end um, is going to look like. Right. And then we do the design. And then my husband does a lot of the project management because he's an academic. So he has much more flexible hours than I do. And then All I right. come in and was the end and I do the finishes and then we also do the marketing. The properties we've sold, we've sold just by ourselves through our contacts. Oh wow. No, you said I didn't yeah. involve. No, we don't use any agents. It's just we put them on social media. WhatsApp, WhatsApp has actually been very good for us. WhatsApp statuses have managed to sell a, a few million worth of uh, properties. <laughs> I love this. I love this. Like it's a different market altogether. I think for people altogether. that are listening to from who are based in South Africa, they're like, "What? Do you, can you do that?" Yep. And and I like the fact that you can do it, and you you are a testimony to it. So, Tanya, what's your husband's name? Um, Mutusi. Mutusi. So yes. the, the question that I want to ask of you. So when I started off going into business, my wife's name is Jenna, and me and Jenna, we we, we kind of like we couldn't work together. 
right? Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's, let's, let's just put it that way. There was lots of intense fellowship. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm fascinated with people that look the part like, you know, they get it right. Like what you're telling us today, it almost sounds like, ah, you're a boyfriend and girlfriend and you're like, you know what, dude, this is what you're going to do. This is what I'm going to do. And boom, it's working, right? But, but I almost want to get into the granular of it. With my wife, it, it wasn't that easy. The intense fellowship, Jesus needed to come down. And, uh, you know, there was lots of intense fellowship that happened. Uh, not even for one incident, but for a long time, almost like three years. Um, uh -huh. and, and then until we, we figured out our own strengths, and weaknesses and what we enjoy doing. And we started now figuring out each other's lane. And that way we started managing each other that way. And then that's when we only started working. But people would see us like, oh, wow, you work so well together. They didn't know the intense fellowship that was happening behind the closed doors. And, and as a couple in mm -hmm. your space, how have you navigated that? I think we were fortunate in that when we started dating, I was, I'd already had a few years work experience and there was right. man, um, man, a few years of management experience. So I'd gone through all the personality tests and team roles, that type of stuff and project work. So I had some basic project management um, experience. So I just then used that experience to say, look, this is how we're running the project and this is how we're dividing the roles. It wasn't as structured as you would expect a, a big project management framework to work, but there was some use of it. And I had very early on identified what my strengths are and what his strengths are, and then use that to just leverage to say, look, can you handle this? I'll handle this aspect. And fortunately, I just say it's a blessing. We just complemented each other. I like the way that you take different structures out there and you implement it into your own life and it just works for you. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I five for you. It's <laughs> so I one of my I, I call it a key strength is I am able to separate my emotions from right. um, what needs to be done. So I can come in and say, you know what, look, I, I do I, I'm not egotistical. I can say, look, I'm not good at, at this at all. So I'm gonna hand it over to somebody else. I will know the basics, but I will say, look, it's not an area I'm good at or I want to play in. So I'm just going to hand it over. You have just hit the nail on its head. It's a very important skill to have in business. Um, having, not, I don't want to say not having emotions because as people, we are intertwined by emotions, right? But knowing when to yeah. switch on and, and, and to switch off or when, when to rely on those emotions and on when not to, and to physically be able to say, it's not an emotional decision. It has to be a numbers decision. Let's do it A, B, C, D. Yeah. Oh, and then you, you kind of like just put your emotions in the closet. Then you go and pick them up a little bit later, right? And, and that, I think for you, that's a, that's a real, real success, key character, I haven't met you. I haven't been to boards to meet you, but just by listening to what you say and know for me, knowing how business is run, I think that's a winning recipe for you. It is, it is, it works very well. Awesome. So Tunya, um, you've done multiple projects. Um, and wh where are you taking your business to? Are you taking your business into building a portfolio with you and your husband? Or are you wanting to do multiple flips? Uh, what, what, what's, your, what's your strategy? What is it that you want to do or already are doing now in the property space? So in right now, our key strategy, I've got two, my husband and I, we've got two strategies that we want to follow. We right. want to build multiple um, multi reses so that right. we have um, an income stream that we yep. can generate. Use. Um, we've got two young kids, so school fees are crazy expensive and it's going to run for <laughs> about 20 years 
We've yeah. still got another 20 years of paying school fees. So we want that income stream that guarantees that, look, whatever happens in the job space, the kids' school fees is taken care of. And also in future, it'll also fund our retirement. Um, we're getting, we're in that age bracket where we really now need to seriously um, plan for our retirement. And then also we do buy and sell, uh, sorry, build and sells for entry right. level. Um, yeah. And that gives us, pre-COVID was giving us a return in about nine months. Um, there's okay. the land transfer process here is a bit tedious sometimes, um, but it's, at least we were getting good returns every nine months and we could generate a good chunk of money that would either finance holiday. I mean, our wedding was paid for by our building projects. Oh, wow. Um, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that finances big chunk, big expenses like weddings. Well, we're not going to have another one holidays and buying additional property. Great stuff. In your journey so far from when you, your, your senses were awakening, or should I say we awakened in terms of now knowing that, oh, property can do this because your entry was kind of like by accident. But now that you knew that property can do this, I'm sure you kind of like sat down and you're like, I would like to see this and this and this happening in terms of benefits um, uh, uh, during property. What are some of those benefits that you're potentially seeing now that you are realizing at the moment that you were dreaming of back then? So, I was very clear when I said I wanted to go in the rental space was yeah. to generate a steady stream of income. I'm not where I want to be in terms of the income that I want to be generating, but I'm very confident that, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm very confident that I will get there soon. Um, and then a positive that I actually hadn't thought about, but I'm now seeing is my children. They're getting right. to watch me work and build something that they can use in future. Because I think for a lot of people who work corporate jobs, our kids don't get to understand and see what working means. Oh, My daughter on. for yeah. the longest time believed working was me sitting in front of a computer. She still does now with COVID. She believes my work is just sitting and having Teams meetings. But on the weekends, when I go to um, on-site visits and, and just managing the projects, um, they get to go with us. I've taken my son to building supply shops so he understands what it entails to actually build a property. And I want them in future when they see these properties generating money to remember how those were acquired. Well done, well done on that. In all the journeys that you've been, to me, you kind of like sound, you know, you're very serious acquiring about acquiring knowledge. You're very serious about doing stuff as well. Is there a favorite business book that potentially you can share with us that you, it has potentially changed the way you think, the way you do property investments? Um, is there one or two books maybe you can share with us? So I read Robert, is it Robert Lee making money out of property in South Africa? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, about two years ago. And I think I then started rereading it and things just happened and I didn't finish my, my second reading. I loved it because he really demystifies investing in property. While it says in South Africa, there's still a lot of similarities in Botswana and you can learn quite a lot. And it also gives you a sense of where you need to be going um, and building a strategy around your property investment. The old model was, um, I have a piece of land, I just built something and I rent it out for whatever's available. And we didn't talk about the returns, the numbers behind the, the build. It was as long as I've built and I'm getting money out, um, it doesn't matter what, how much I'm getting out. But now with the Robert Lee's book, it then helps you also look at the numbers. And then earlier this year, I read a book called The E-Myth, by Michael Gerber. And the one quotation that comes out of that book is, you need to work on your business and not in your business. So now I'm looking at how to make sure that I'm now working on my business and set it up in such a way that it can still continue without me. I like that. I see a lot of me in you. Um, uh, I mean, you talk about Jason Lee in terms of reading uh, his books and the principles of, yeah. I mean, when I started off, even up to now, I read a lot of books from guys who are in Europe and guys who are in the States. And I kind of like ask myself, how can I apply it here? What is it yes. called? What are the similarities? 
because those guys are a little bit advanced than where we are in terms of property markets. But what can I learn and implement? So well done on that. In closing, Satrinya, what does success look like for you? Whew, I, this question is always interesting. Um, success for me, um, it's building, uh, I actually have a number of what I would like to have as my property portfolio in five okay. years. And more than that is the journey. It's being able to build something as a family. My husband and I partner in every single project we've done since we started dating. Um, and then also my kids to watch what it takes to build a business and to have that business now being self-sustaining. So Tina, I want to ask of you, that, that was my last question. Now this is my last last. Yeah, okay. Building a business with someone that you love, someone that is a partner. To me, it has brought in different discoveries of my partner. It has brought in different realization of who we are. It, it has made me to love my wife a little bit more different than before. And where we, what we are chasing for in our household is synchronized and there is no pushing or pulling apart. And we are one force. So what we set out as goals, we achieve those. Sometimes we say it's an achievement of one year, but we actually achieve it much faster because there's two people working behind it. In closing, what has been your experience having to work with your partner in a business that belongs to, to the two of you? It's been very good because I have managed to achieve a whole lot more than I would have achieved on my own. I mean, right. I was working full time. So a lot of my projects were taking longer than I would have wanted them to take because there were instances where I had to pause and actually focus on work, which is where my, my primary income comes from. But mm -hmm. now with my partner, we're able to alternate. Where he's not able to do something, I can come in and where, and vice versa. So my daughter is here bugging me because she wants something. <laughs> <laughs> they say that one can do one man's job. Two can do three men's job. And I believe that, I think in 2019, um, we were planning our wedding. We did two building projects and we also did a, a renovation project. So at the end of the year, and we are also setting up a different business, at the end of the year, we're like, oh my goodness, this under normal circumstances should have killed us. Say hi. <laughs> this Hello. under normal circumstances should have killed us, but because yeah. there's the two of us, we just managed to navigate. Awesome stuff. It's been great, Satrinya, hanging out with you. Uh, I thank you very much for, you know, giving us nuggets of how things are working in Botswana, but I, I don't think it's just about Botswana for me. Just hearing your stories uh, of how you've navigated. Hello, there's another guest again. And, and what's your name? I like your hairstyle, man. Thanks. <laughs> okay, good. Oh, he's Thanks. also TJ. You're TJ, yeah. He's TJ as well. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah. Nice, nice. So thanks a lot for hang, ha having us. Uh, let me not hold you for your next meeting. And um, yeah, when it comes, when the video is out, we'll let you know. All right. Okay, thanks, Thank Sinia. you. Cheers. It was lovely meeting you. Thanks, Sammy. Hey, cheers, bye-bye. Bye. 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 Okay, in conclusion, that was Trinia out from Botswana and uh, she just nailed it, man in terms of what she does. And you could see that kids came in and you thought I was the only TJ. I actually just met another TJ from Botswana with a Mohawk, you know, gold thingy that he had there. I like that. And this is what it's all about, coming up together, setting up the business together as a family, forward running as a family, building, creating empires. And my heart goes out to Sitrinya and, um, Anyone can do this. You can do it. It's just about putting in the action, learning as you go, and making sure that everything that you've got, at least you're being profitable whilst you're doing it and enjoying it along the way. 
My name is TJ. It's been great hanging out with you today. We'll check you out on the next video.